All right, well, good evening. Good to see all of you. A special welcome to the youth that are here. We're so glad that you're with us. Uh, you know, we're, just, we're glad to have you join us, especially inside. And um, yeah, we love worshiping with you guys. So uh, if you're an anchor, say hi to a youth. It's your homework assignment for the next couple hours. All right? And um, so, uh, yeah, we have started this series last Sunday, and we're calling it Let's Talk. And uh, these sermon series, uh, yeah, we're hoping to just, you know, come together as a family and kind of have some family talks, right? That's the idea behind this. Let's, let's talk about some of these issues which are very controversial in our culture right now and that all of us have a lot of questions about and I think all of us, a lot of us have different opinions and we've had some side conversations here, here and there, but right now in these next few weeks we want to just come together and let's just talk together and let's, uh, let's, 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 uh, let's um, go to the Word and see what the Word says and then let's continue the conversations in our community groups and our discipleship groups you know, out just in a, at a restaurant or over boba or whatever, right? These sermons are meant to be the starting place for conversation, not the end of conversation. So that's the heart of what we're doing in these next few weeks. I hope that you guys can come, and I hope that you also can come to the discussions that we're going to be having in our community groups. Those are probably just as important as hearing the sermon, because we want to have a dialogue about these things. We want to hear your questions. We want to hear your pushbacks, right? We want to talk through these things. That's what we want to do here at Anchor. We don't want to avoid tough topics. We want to engage them, bringing every topic to the Word of God. And that's what we're doing. So today, let's talk about racism. Let's talk about racism. Now, when I say racism, I would guess that at least some of you here probably feel a little bit fatigued by this topic. And, you know, that's because this has been such a huge topic over the past year, year and a half, and not just a year, last year and a half, probably the last five years in our culture, in our discourse. But, you know, for that reason, I really think it's important for us to include this topic in our series because it's such a touch point in our culture today, especially if you're, well, at any age, but I think younger, younger people, too, are, are talking about this all the time. I would actually say in our American culture right now, this topic, racism, and next week's topic, sexuality, are the two hinge points of our culture. I think these two topics are, you know, like the reason that a lot of people aren't Christians, because uh, there's a lot of so much controversy over these things, very polarized, so many uh, questions. And, you know, I know this past year, you know, there are like a lot of different things in the news that caused... Uh, this to be talked about at a new level. George Floyd uh, last year, I think, was a turning point in our culture when it comes to this topic. And it kind of reached a new level in our culture. And other flare-ups this past year, right? I mean, if you think about it, for Asian Americans, the Atlanta shootings and the anti-Asian violence and all that stuff in the news caused a kind of another different kind of heightened awareness um, and there's all these debates, and, and look, you know, even though it's, this topic is so controversial, you can't just ignore it. Now, we can't ignore it as a church. We can't just wait for, you know, kind of just, you know, hope it's just going to go away, because there's going to be more incidents. There's going to be more events. There's going to be more flare-ups. And... Instead of just waiting for another incident, let's talk. All right, let's talk about this. Let's have an open discussion about this. And, and here are the questions that I think we should be thinking about, okay, when we're talking about racism. How, how should we think about this issue? 
especially when there are so many different opinions and perspectives about it. Okay? How should we think about it, especially as Christians? Okay? Uh, what is the solution or the way forward? Right? And, and yeah, most importantly, and I hope that you've been trying to ask this question, what does God think about this issue? Right? How does his word guide us? So that's what we're going to uh, talk about tonight. So before we, we, uh, we, we go further, let's just pray. Let's bring this uh, to God. Lord, we thank you, God, for gathering us here tonight. And Lord, this is a weighty topic. This is a, uh, a topic in which our country is so divided. And so, Lord, I really pray for your wisdom tonight, for my words. May my words be deeply rooted in your word. May I only speak uh, your word. <laughs> and Lord, would you guide us? Would you help us to hear your voice? And uh, Lord, be with us, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so here's where I want to start tonight, okay? I think the first place we got to start is this, okay? My first idea. Racism breaks God's heart and it should break ours as well. Racism breaks God's heart, and it should break ours as well. And uh, so let me first start with a very simple definition of racism, okay? Because we have to first define that if we're going to talk about it, right? And this is just my simple definition. It's not like, you know, uh, people have different definitions, right? But my, for purposes of this sermon, I'm going to say racism is when we see one culture or ethnic group, okay, that's how I'm going to define race for this. Uh, some people use the word race, culture, ethnic group. Usually it's your own as superior to another culture or ethnic group and you look down on them, okay? And this can be in ways that are very obvious and intentional. And this also can be in ways that are not so obvious and not really intentional. But they still are seeing your culture as superior to another. And look, because we are human beings, this is what the Bible says about human beings. Okay? We are, all human beings are fallen and sinful and so racism has been a problem in our world forever. Okay? Listen, this is not just a problem that has, that has happened in the last five years in America. It is not even a problem that is only, is only uh, we've seen in the last 400 years in America. This problem has been throughout the history of the human race, and it will be a problem until Jesus comes back. And, and this is why that's true, because, um, you know, as human beings, what the Bible teaches us is that human beings are selfish, fallen, twisted, self-justifying creatures, including every single human being in this room. And, and, and the problem started way at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. Okay? In the Garden of Eden, with the very first human beings, what we see is that Adam and Eve, the first human beings, are created by God— what they did was they decided to reject God's word and reject the creator and instead choose to define good and evil on their own terms. And because they did this, what happened was they broke the relationship between human beings and God, right? But not only that, because of sin entering the world, now their relationship with one another was also broken forever, and you see this right from the beginning of the Bible, right? When Adam and Eve sinned and sin entered the world, what did they first start doing? They started blaming each other. You see that in the Genesis accounts. They started blaming each other. And then Adam and Eve's kids, right? Just one generation later, Cain murders uh, his brother Abel out of jealousy, out of hatred. You, you see the hatred beginning to form between human beings, and so goes the rest of human history. We are selfish people curved inwards. And the Bible, but the Bible is also clear about this, okay? 
this is not the way it was meant to be. This was not God's design. Right? And God's plan is to redeem this fallen and broken world from the very beginning. Look at, uh, look at what it says in Genesis 1, 27. This is uh, in the creation of human beings. It says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what the Bible teaches is that the, the human, be- human beings, all human beings of all cultures and ethnicities are created in the image of God. Right? And that's what it sets human beings apart from the rest of creation. Only human beings are created in the image of God. And because of that, right, all cultures and ethnicities are all to be treated with dignity and equality. Right? It doesn't say you know, only certain, this, this group of people were created in the image of God and uh, these other group of people were not. No, we're all created in the image of God. God, and therefore, right, you know, we believe in equality and dignity for, dignity for all people, right? Or in our culture today, that is one of the most, the strongest values, right? I mean, if you, if you say to someone in America, I don't believe in human rights or the dignity of all human beings, you're going to get, you know, quickly exiled, Right? That is just common sense in our culture. But look, this is very interesting here, I think. I think, you know, if you really think about it, right, why, why do you believe that? What's, what's the rationale for believing that? If you don't believe in God, if you believe that we're all here because of random chance, because of random forces, and really, you know, everything, absolutely everything is just a result of natural selection, Right, what does that teach us? It teaches us that the strong eat the weak. Right? So if everything really is just random, then, then you, know, you know, natural selection teaches us that you should not look out for other groups. You should only look out for the members of your genetic group. But no one believes that, right? But why? Only Christianity has this sure foundation from because we believe in God because we believe God created all human beings and he created all human beings no matter what human being they are in the image of God so only Christianity has this foundation for equality and really this idea comes from the Bible right and and then when you read the rest of the Bible and I'm going to just give you a little brief overview of the story of the Bible you know in terms of this idea we see how God desires to redeem this broken world with all of its barriers and walls of hostility that we build between us. And God's plan is to redeem us from that. Right? So, so in Genesis, we're introduced, God decides, I'm going to choose this guy, Abraham. Right? And Abraham is going to be the father of my chosen people. And what does he say to Abraham? Is, 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 this is the promise for you. This is, this is what's going to happen. He says uh, to Abraham, In you, Genesis 12, 3, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families. Right? This was the plan from the beginning, that all cultures and ethnic groups would be blessed, would experience the blessing of God through his people. Right? And in the rest of the Old Testament, we, see, we begin to see this plan start to unfold. Right? And sometimes you look at the Old Testament, you're like, dude, like, does God only like the Israelites? Does he think that Jewish people are superior to other people? No. No, the plan was always for the Jewish people, the Israelites, to be a blessing to all the nations. And so you, you start to see this in the Old Testament. Did you know this? Some of the patriarchs, the, you know, those... those uh, key figures in Genesis, they, they married foreigners. Did you know Joseph married an Egyptian woman? This is Genesis 41, 45. Did you know Moses? He marries a Cushite woman who is, that's modern-day Ethiopia. 
Moses married an Ethiopian woman. And then when the Israelites come out of Egypt, it says uh, a mixed multitude came with them. All right, and that probably means there's a bunch of Egyptians and maybe some other cultures. A bunch of people came out with them and were part of the people of God. And then you move forward to the New Testament. You meet Jesus and you look at his genealogy in Matthew. And a couple of names in that genealogy really stick out. And they are two foreign women who are part of his genealogy. You have Ruth the Moabite and Rahab the Canaanite. Jesus himself was of mixed blood. Right? And then we see Jesus in Jesus' ministry. Uh, he really uh, he embraced non-Jewish people. Uh, very intentionally and reaching out to them through his ministry, much to the dismay of the Jewish people who were like, who looked down on the Gentiles, the dirty Gentiles, the non Jewish people. But Jesus did it anyways. And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, right? And the question in Luke 10 was, who, who's, who is your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? How should you treat your neighbor? And and he tells a story, and the hero of the story is a a hated mixed-blood Samaritan as the hero of the story. And then he says, this is how you should love your neighbor. You move on to uh, uh, the the letters of Paul, and you read statements like this in Colossians 3.11. Paul says, here there is no Greek, there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. In Christ, right? What Paul's saying, in Christ, there is no Greek or Jew, slave or free. What this means is not saying that these differences in different cultures are erased. No, it does not, that does not mean that. It says what it means that in Christ, though, those barriers have been torn down. All of us, no matter our race, our culture, our social economic status, right? We're all sinners. But in Christ, right? Christ is all and in all, no matter who you are. You know, all of us are sinners. We all deserve the punishment of sin, but Christ died for all of us. And in Christ, as Ephesians 2.14 says, it says this, for referring to Jesus, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And in that passage, he's specifically talking about the, the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And you see God's heart? Do you see God's heart as in, in the Bible? God's heart is to break down those walls of hostility we have created among us because of sin by the blood of Christ. Right? We, to bring all people, no matter who you are, to the cross, to bring us to, to God. And to reconcile us first, all people to God. Yes, that is first, we need to be reconciled to God, but also to be reconciled to one another. That's that's the heart of God. So racism, right, it breaks God's heart. It's against his design. And it should break ours too. But, but here's the second thing, the second, I, second point here that I think is maybe equally as important in this discussion and as we try to think about it. Right? I, I think in this discussion today, we must resist political idolatry when we think about this issue. We must resist political idolatry Right? And, you know, so I use this term political idolatry, and this is what I mean by that, right? I think in America today, that's exactly what politics is. It's idolatry. 
we have turned our political views into um, ide- not just our political, but the ideologies that, that are behind them on both sides. There's two sides in America, the political left and the political right, and they have become into false gods, right? And every issue, and racism is a prime example of this, gets reduced to a debate between two political views in America. And, you know, I think as Christians, we must, we must, we must resist the temptation to become idolatrous like everyone else and either worship the God of the left or the God of the right. And, here, and here's, here's how this plays out when we talk about racism, okay? You know, I think this quote by Tim Keller kind of uh, captures it pretty perfectly. Like, I think the state of uh, race discussions in America, listen to what he says. He says, a big issue today is systemic or institutionalized injustice. And I think you can replace injustice for racism, okay? So systemic racism. I define the right as those who say it hardly exists in the U.S. anymore. I define the left as those who say it explains everything and is the total cause of all unequal outcomes. These two sides are by far the loudest and most numerous voices on social media. Others, like me, Tim Keller, say systemic institutionalized injustice or racism certainly exists. And we break into groups that say A, but not often, or B, often, or C, quite a lot, but not always. Those of us in these three groups, however, are all depicted by the left and the right as really stealth members of the other evil side. It's important to remember that each of these sides has gradations. If we did, it would change some of the conversations and rhetorical points. You know, isn't that true? Isn't that how the conversation goes today in America? Right? Because one side will always will say, basically, systemic racism doesn't really exist. What's, you know, that's just not a problem. Right? And the other side will say it explains pretty much all unequal outcomes. And it explains everything. And that these two sides just shout at each other constantly on social media or cable news. Right? I think it also breaks down in kind of demographically, right? I think older generations tend to be on the political right. Younger generations tend to be on the political left. And so it's just this shouting match against one another. And here's where the idolatry comes in, which is why I think it is idolatry. We get sucked into these tribes, right? You're either one or the other. One side is completely right, and the other side is completely evil, right? And you have to basically kind of receive the package deal. That's what politics is today, package deals, right? You can't be like, well, I like some of these points here, but I like some of these points over here. No, no, no. You have to either be accept everything in this package over here or accept everything in this package over here. And if you do that, I think you become an idolater. Um, friends, this is, this is what idolatry is, right? When you make uh, one ideology, one perspective, which probably, which has true and valid points in it, right? But you take that one ideology and you, and you say it explains everything and it is the answer to all the problems and you begin to say, you know, this one piece of the truth is the ultimate truth, that's when you've replaced God, right? You, and you just begin to trap yourself into echo chambers and refuse to listen to people from the other side. This is, I think this is a... Um, this is maybe a litmus test of whether you've kind of fallen into political idolatry, right? If when you talk about these issues, you're, you're, you begin to start to feel like you're being filled with hatred for people on the other side, if you begin to feel like 
you're, you're beginning to feel very self-righteous towards people on the other side. If, if you're beginning to feel like you're, you're, you're kind of demonizing people on the other side, right? That's the fruit of idolatry. Here's what the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is when you're worshiping the true God. When you're worshiping the true God, you should be filled with love and patience and kindness and gentleness, right? I mean, also truth. I mean, you got to tell the truth, but there's truth with love, patience, kindness, gentleness, right? Let me, you know, how, how does the Bible fit into these the political ideologies when it comes to race. Well, let me show you. Let me try to just show you very briefly how I think the Bible, it just doesn't fit into the categories that we've been given, right? Because on the political left, right, we are told that the main problem with the world is systemic injustice and racism, and they will highlight uh, things, and, and these are, I think these things are very valid, right? But they'll highlight these things to the exclusion of others. They'll, they'll highlight the fact that, you know, even though in America slavery was abolished hundreds of years ago, there are still unjust systems of racism and injustice that continue through the effects of Jim Crow laws, redlining, right? We could talk uh, on the left, you know, we'll talk about a lot of false stereotypes, uh, the way that minorities are depicted in Hollywood, and, you know, to all that, I'm like, I think those are some good points. I think those are true. I think those are real realities. But if you go to the political right, what you're going to be told is the main problem is not, not all of that is not the main problem. The main problem is personal responsibility, right? In America, all these problems are caused not by systemic racism, but by the breakdown of the family, and, and the problem in this world is the welfare state that discourages people from taking responsibility and causes dependence. Right? Well, listen, there is a lot of truth there too. Right? And if you're, if you're, if you're here and you're like, well, I think that's just all wrong, or I think that's just all wrong, I think that... You've drifted into this tribalism because if you look at the Bible, the Bible says, you know what? Yeah, all of these things are problems. Uh, this is an this is interesting quote I heard recently by this author, H. L. Mencken, and he says this. For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And I think that's what our politics has become, right? The issues in our country are very, very complex, right? But our political ideologies say there's this one simple solution to this complex problem. But I think the Bible says, no, 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 no. The, these issues are very complex, and uh, there's a nuanced view of, of human nature and, and of uh, how things work. Um, let me just show you a little bit from Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. <laughs> and I think it's a book of wisdom because you see it if you just read the book of Proverbs, how it nuances the human condition and how complex it is. So if you look at uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, there are some verses there that say this, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Okay, so here it seems to be saying there's a direct link between poverty and laziness, right? I mean, if you are lazy, then you might become poor, right? But then you look at Proverbs 23. Look at Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23 says, the fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. All right, so here in Proverbs 23, it's saying like, there are also some times when even the poor are working hard, but, but injustice sweeps away their resources. 
right? And so what the Bible is showing us is it doesn't fit into the camps, right? Is, is it all, are the problems caused by systemic racism or personal responsibility? The Bible says both. The Bible says there are multiple causes for the problems we see in our world today. It's all of the above. It's systemic racism. It's stereotypes in the media. It's economic issues in reality. It's the breakdown of the family. It's laziness. It's dependence. It's all of it. And as Christians, we should speak against, out against all of it. Not just pick three of them and ignore the rest. You know, we just studied 1 John, right? Remember what that last verse of 1 John was? The final phrase that John leaves us with. 1 John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Right? Don't fall prey to the idols of our culture on the left or the right. Right? God does not fit. Right? You cannot mold him and shape him into one, uh, you know, one side or the other. That's idolatry, my friends. Be a Christian before you are a Democrat. Be a Christian before you are a Republican. Study God's word more than you listen to influencers or podcast hosts or pundits. If you don't do that, you're, you're, getting, you're, you're, you're getting tempted by the idolatry of our age. And friends, I, just, I see this on both sides, right? In groups, younger groups, there is kind of one tendency towards idolatry. In older groups, there is the opposite tendency of idolatry with different ethnic groups. There is falling prey into one uh, idolatry or the other, and I just feel like God is just dismayed. I think he's just dismayed. And you know what? God is going to judge us. Did you worship me? Or did you mold me into the idols of your day? So how can we move forward? How can we move forward? You know, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, I'll probably could talk about this for another couple hours. I'm not going to, right? And there's so much to talk, which is why I want us to continue this discussion later, right? But let me just offer just two, just two very s small pieces. There's other things to be said as well, right? But here are a couple of things that I think will help us to move forward, right? And the first one is this. We need to build real in-person relationships with people different from us. I think that's the first way we're going to move forward. I think one of the reasons this issue is in the state that it is today is that we do not have these anymore. Right? And we had George Floyd and these other incidents happen while we were in, while we were in COVID lockdown. So in COVID lockdown, you can't actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with anybody, right? So every, this was going on, and everyone's inside in front of their computers and on their phones, on social media 24 hours a day. And what has happened is that no one talks to each other anymore. We just shout at each other from social media, right? What we need are real relationships with people, real long-term relationships with people who are different from you, right? Because I think, man, when you're, when you're just hanging out with someone of a different culture, long-term, right? I'm not talking about tokenism here, right? But you have a real relationship where, dude, man, you're just, man, you're just, you're at McDonald's and you're just like having the Big Mac and fries, right? Or, 
or you're just enjoying like dessert or, you know, a good meal. And you're having fun and you can talk and you can listen to one another's stories that are different from yours. And you don't have to be triggered by every little thing because you're friends and you can ask each other questions and you know each other and you build trust. And that's where some of these stereotypes and assumptions can be broken down. But if you never do that and you just stay on social media all the time and you're always around people who are just like you, whether that's age, whether that's socioeconomic status, whether that's your ethnic group, whether that's, yeah, uh, political persuasions, you become further and further divided. Because all you see is people from the other group, the worst examples of it on, on the internet. And, you know, I know that, okay, let's be real here, fam, right? We are, we're, we're kind of in an Asian American bubble here, right? Uh, especially if you grow up and you live in Walnut, Rolling Heights, Diamond Bar, it's an Asian American bubble. And our church, I mean, let's, let's just be real here, we're a predominantly Asian American church. And, and this is what I'll just say about that real briefly. This can also be a whole sermon, right? I think God needs all types of churches. I think God uses all types of churches to do his work. I think God loves and he uses, he loves Asian American churches. He loves Chinese churches. He loves Korean churches. He loves black churches. He loves Hispanic churches. And he loves multi-ethnic churches that where there's, there's an equal amount of every group. And he loves them and he uses them to reach all types of people. And so I'm not embarrassed I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed that I'm Asian American and our church, you know, I think God is using us to reach a lot of Asian Americans. I'm not embarrassed about that. But I will say that, yes, we are in a little bit of a bubble. And honestly, this is something that I, I it's a goal of mine. I want to work on this for myself. I, would, I, I want to build more relationships with people who are not like me. Right? And, you know, I think we need to take baby steps here, right? And we don't, you know, be careful about tokenism, right? So you just, you know, you know, what's happened in this past year and a half? You know, you listen to some black people, right? And it's actually, I know someone like this. And he's like, I've been the one black friend for like 50 people. I've gotten so many calls and, you know, and, you know, that's tokenism, right? That's not a long-term relationship, Right? And so I would just say, I would invite everyone here today just to be like, well, look at your workplace. Look at your schools. These are the things that you're naturally in anywhere. And just try to build some relationships with people who don't look like you. Right? Just try to be, just try to be friends with them. Try to understand them. Try to understand their story. Ask them lots of questions. Right? I think that's one step forward. And you know what? Invite them to church. Invite them to church. Our church is welcome to all people. I hope everyone agrees with that. Anyone, no matter what race, socioeconomic status, you're welcome here. And I want that to be our vibe. Right? I'm not embarrassed that we're Asian American. I'm proud to be Asian American. Okay? But our doors are always open to anyone. Invite them to the barbecue. Right? I'd love to meet them. Right? I think that's, that's step one. Right? I think step two, and actually this isn't on my PowerPoint, but I think step two is that, you know, we need to partner with organizations that are doing long-term good in our community. That are that are really fighting some of these underlying issues. And I mentioned there's a lot of them, right? You know, a lot of different factors to the hardships, uh, marginalization and poverty. And there's a lot of different, so there's tons of different organizations doing different types of things, and we need to partner with them, right? And, you know, uh, as a church, I think this is an area we need to grow in. And there are some ideas that I have and, and we're tossing back and forth behind the scenes and we're trying to work on them. And I'm, I'm open to hearing more ideas. You've got ideas? Let me know, right? 
you know, we can't do everything, okay? We have to, you know, we're just so many things we have to do as a church, right? But yeah, th- this is the reason why we do, we have this partnership with Vehar, the school that we, we meet at, right? And actually, I just texted the principal this week, and I was like, how can we serve your students? How can we serve especially the marginalized families of Vehar? And she said, I'm going to give you a list next week, right? And so we're going to be getting, right, let's do it. You know, it might be over the next few weeks, but we're going to be doing a school supply drive again, right? There's some other organizations I know that are doing really good work behind the scenes, places like crisis pregnancy centers, right, who are, who are helping people on the front lines, and I think we need to partner with organizations like that, right, to do real good, to do long-term good, right? So that's number two. Lastly, I would say, how can you move forward? Well, I think this is just something that we just always need to remember, right? You got to keep our hope in the gospel. You got to keep our hope in the gospel. Friends, the Bible says that racism is real, that it breaks the heart of God, that we should fight against it. But, but friends, look, the biggest problem in our world is not racism. The biggest problem in our world is not the lack of personal responsibility. The biggest problem of, in this world is not the breakdown of the family. The root of all these problems is sin. And listen, that's why all these ide- ideologies, they'll never give us the real solution. Because, yeah, they're, they're, they always miss out on this fact. Do we need political solutions? Of course. Do we need laws? Of course. Do we need to just not talk about the gospel, but actually do something? Of course, amen, to all of that. But what ultimately breaks down the dividing walls of hostility between us? What's really going to break down the dividing walls? Is it going to be laws? The Bible says what really breaks down the dividing walls between us is the blood of Christ. The cross that humbles us all people, that puts all people in their right place. All people are sinners at the foot of the cross. All people, no matter who you are, we need the righteousness and the blood of Christ to save us. The cross humbles all of us and it also lifts all of us up to be reconciled to God and to be righteous. And why are you righteous? Why are you righteous? Where, where does your righteousness lie? What makes you feel secure that you're a good person? Is your righteousness in your own hard work? Is that how you know that you're a good person? Because you worked hard and you pulled yourself up by the bootstraps? Is that where your righteousness is? Is your righteousness in your morality? That you, you know, you're not like those people out there who sleep around and party. Is that, is that why you're righteous? Is your righteousness in your social activism? Is that how you know you're righteous? Because you are more socially active and aware. The Bible says you are righteous only by the blood of Jesus. We just sang it. Right? Our righteousness is only in the blood of Jesus. We need to remember that. We need to put our hope in that and not in political activism. Right? We need to work for justice in this world while putting our hope in Jesus and in his return. And friends, that's the way forward. That's the way forward. Let's pray. God, this is a, a complex issue, and Lord, I, uh, I tremble because I, you know, I know I, I, I'm a human being, and I, it's hard to do justice to the complexities of this issue, Lord, but God, when I study your word, this is what I see. 
I see your heart broken by these dividing walls of hostility in our country and all over the world. I see your heart broken by the divisiveness the reductionism, the idolatry of molding Jesus into the shape of political parties. And Lord, I, God, I, I, my, my burden for our church, Lord, is that we would be followers of Jesus. We would follow you where you lead. We would worship you. We would always put our hope in the blood of your blood that we would also love our neighbors, that we would act on our beliefs. And Lord, we, uh, God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just give us wisdom in this area, Lord. Lord, as a, yeah, as a church in uh, kind of in this Asian American bubble, I, I pray that you would open our eyes to the, to the, to the how you want to lead us in this area. Lord, I pray that you would keep us faithful to you. God, keep us faithful to you. Lord, yeah, I do pray that you would, you know, even uh, in our relationships, that we would seek to try to understand different people and love them. In whatever capacity uh, in whatever baby steps, you know, in whatever situations you've called us in, Lord, I think the follow-up for each one of us is different depending on our life situations. Lord, would you help us just to be obedient? And God, Lord, would you bring us back to the cross each and every, in each and every issue that we have questions about? Would you bring us back to the cross each and every week as we come before you as we come to you tonight, Lord, we remember that your blood has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. Would you help us, Lord, to live in light of that blood? And God, we want to come to you tonight and confess our sins. Confess ways that we have had racist, you know, every one of us has something to confess here. We come before you and we, we want to confess ways in which we've kind of subtly assumed that our culture is better than other cultures or have assumed things unfairly. Lord, forgive us. invite you to respond to God's word now. If you are a Christian with us tonight, you have put your trust in Jesus. I want to invite you to respond by taking communion at the back there whenever you're ready. And say a little prayer tonight about this issue. As you drink the juice, which symbolizes the blood of Christ, and the cracker, which symbolizes his body, which was given for this broken world, for you in your sin. Take and remember your sin and say a prayer for this broken world. Say, say a prayer, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. The Lord's Supper, we, there's also a time to remember and to, to await the time where he will come in you and bring his kingdom of justice. Come, Lord Jesus. Say that prayer as you take communion. If you're not a Christian with us tonight, uh, don't take communion. That's something for those of us who have taken that step, but we're so glad that you're here with us, Lord. And, and so we I invite you to respond however you feel led to. You. Sing with us, pray to God. If you want to pray with me, I'll be in the back. Let's respond.